Rabito is back with us. Thanks for joining us. Cool. Thanks for having me, man. It's been like nine months. I mean, I, we loved the show last time. We talked about, uh, you know, your your work, your big book there, World Government, Population Control, the History of Elitism. But we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the conflict in the Middle East. It we're actually coincides brave. with all of this stuff, believe it yeah, or not. for sure. Yeah. Well, we're going to brave those waters because we've sort of, you know, we've kind of, we've talked about it a little bit, but we've kind of avoided uh, going too deep into it. I mean, it's such a polarizing thing. It's It's such a fascinating time to see everybody everybody's split now a different way right like i, I get was it going when we so it wasn't going when we talked last time i guess no, at that time it was the ukraine russian thing yeah. that was kind of at the forefront yeah and now it's which, now which, it's, which sort of did the same thing but this is that on steroids yeah and now it's split everybody a different way right it's kind of chopped us up in a different way because now you're seeing like i'm really interested to get your take on this type of thing because we're seeing kind of like or what I was wondering early on is like we're seeing this sort of the let's just say like the lefties and the, maybe like a little bit more of the woke side that have usually have like the mainstream media and the narrative. A lot of those institutions on their side, all of a sudden it's chopped, it's chopped and, and they're they're not. I was like, what are they going to do when they realize that this infrastructure is not behind them in this battle against Israel? Because, of course, a lot of them sided against or, <clears throat> you know, uh, with Palestine right away. It's very sophisticated, man, and uh, this is why it's so significant and important not to pick a side. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, what I always try to tell people is rather than aligning yourself with a specific side or even a person, what you want to try to do always is side with the principles of humanity, which exactly. is simply what is, what is right in this particular scenario. And that's not about skin color. That's not about race. That's not about religion. That's not about geographical location. That's just about humanity. It's very simple. Yeah, yeah, and peace and war, and that's kind of where we're. At. I was like, why? Why is it? Why are people siding in this conflict when there's killing them, killing both ways? Or you know, there was at the beginning, at least. You know, um, it's one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, look, where I, I think so. So the big thing is with the conflict, and I suppose we'll get into this stuff. There has been horrible atrocities on both sides. However, for me, my primary concern is more so who is doing this from a very insidious and calculated place where they're not in a position where they're doing it out of desperation, but they're doing it because for the simple fact that they are sadistic or they have an agenda. And that agenda is just about manipulating everybody for their own selfish purposes. Yeah. Darren was mentioning. Uh, Darren was mentioning before we started. There's been some controversy and controversies in Canada, I guess, with our political parties, and this thing keeps popping up. Right? There's protests in the cities, and these protesters can be a little bit more rambunctious than your normal freedom fighters, and they get they get sort of carte blanche to kind of do what they want. They can block roads and they can block streets, and the cops aren't really doing anything about it. It's very strange to see, like. Almost yeah, remember, said, remember almost during the said, so-called pandemic, how they would, you know, like, yeah. oh, nobody could be together, but then they could have the BLM rallies yeah, and stuff, it's, and it's, it's nobody's similar spreading to, it then. It's, <laughs> it's similar so to that. So, yeah, but so the Jews China, and the blacks used to be on the same, like, side of the, like, I guess the... Uh, oppression? Uh, so, uh, the oppression, the oppressed, the oppressed scale, you know? So, like, shouldn't the Jews be over there with them? Yeah, it, it's it's all quite, I would say it's kind of like mental gymnastics and it's very calculated divide and conquer policies. So, Darren, what were you saying today about the, about the. Oh, well, three of the liberal MPs are Jewish, so they're pissed because of uh, an NDP introduced bill that kind of forced everyone to vote on whether we're. You know, not exactly where they stood, but kind of, you know, mostly where they stood. Part of it was ceasing to arm Israel in any way, supply funding for that. So, you know, the uh, a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, but I think three of the Jewish liberal MPs broke the ranks and voted against the party, which is, you know, interesting because politics is sort of blowing out of control here in Canada as it is. Oh, yeah, especially 100%. At the moment, they started seeing, like, the formidable protests, uh, probably best personified through the, the trucker protests during the so-called pandemic. 
so naturally they viewing the population and the local population as being subversive and dangerous you know what i mean so yeah i always try to just perceive things through the lens of the psychopathy through the parasite class that rules over us and when you do that it becomes much easier to understand um events so how did you how did you navigate this you've moved you were in, i think you were in south africa last time we talked right so yeah. you've moved now to a different part of the world Right. Uh, w was this related to that at all or anything or or was that part that life changed no, uh, no it's it's, it's relatively well, complex where, where we are in in relation to where we are we in a very remote location so uh to get internet yeah i actually had to unfortunately buckle and go get uh, elon musk's starlink because there's no internet yeah already three hours prior there's no internet there's no phone it's a hike just to get to where we currently are but this is where my lady is from this is her native home and it's it's nice and clean yeah and we have a little boy and while whilst we figure out what we're going to be doing i mean there's a lot of um, elements to it but whilst we figure out what we're going to do at least we yeah clean food clean water clean air and we can make decisions accordingly great great yeah yeah darren darren's on musk's thing too and i mean he's like 20 minutes out of a city and he doesn't have decent internet uh so he's he's gone for the musk thing as well yeah it, it does work man it's formidable i can tell you because listen where i am there you will not get internet at you yeah, and yeah. already like i said three hours away before you even get you there's no phone signal there's no internet signal there's nothing so it, it's legit it really does work so and i'm not a fan of Elon musk <laughs> yeah i know but you know gotta do what you gotta do right yeah, no, Brian, he's a fan. Yeah, he's a big fan of Elon Musk. He's what some people would almost call a fanboy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is pretty interesting how the internet is just pretty plug and play. You know, you switch it on, you turn it on, you sort of cancel Very simple, it. You're not dealing with any bullshit contracts or anything like that. It's just like simple. Yeah, it's very simple. What I'm, don't you like I, about Elon? Graham, Graham, you know, let's see if we can get Graham defending Elon again. <laughs> you better ask that again. I don't know if you heard it. So uh, what, what, what wants to go ahead. Uh, what don't you saying like about Musk? Oh, what, what, what was my problem specifically with it? Well, uh, I'm sure you have more than one. You can list them all. No, nah, well, let's let's summarize it so we can get to the topic at hand because the, the one in relation to like Zionism and its history, man, that is such a deep dive. You, it's going to blow your guys' mind, man. It blows my mind every day because I'm still researching it on a daily basis. But in relation to Elon Musk, the number one thing is the whole Neuralink thing. That is a next level form of control. And then secondary, based on my research over the years and being a student of history, the role that I see him filling and I see him playing is one in which he is one of the figures that are that's meant to co-opt and debilitate not facilitate but debilitate a movement that's already in place so the momentum uh for whatever you want to call it the truth movement the alternative media whatever way you would like to frame it that's already afoot independent of elon musk however now he's bought twitter now he appears to be playing somebody that's playing the lead role this is very political in in the way that it's done which is to say politicians they will find a movement and they will do their best to take credit for it. So I, I view him with a great deal of suspicion, man. Um, it's not to say that you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, where something is useful and helpful, it's welcomed. But don't ever give anybody, even myself, you don't give anybody blind obedience, um, unthinking obedience. It's very important to recognize like the parasite clause has been involved in this game, this proverbial game of poker and chess for literally millennia. Like there's families that claim their descendants go, that precede the um, the Roman emperors. So it's just very important to be mindful that whilst we are all becoming aware of how the game of politics works, these people wrote the manual, they wrote the book, and they have but centuries and centuries ahead of us in relation to knowledge. And they likely have esoteric knowledge that we have yet to gain. I like that. I, I think that's a great summary of, of, of Musk. I would, I would agree with that. So Ian wants to know quickly, he's a, he's a big fan of the show. That's why I want to ask this question here. Ian wants to know how much, uh, 
how much is Starlink to get it up and going? Been thinking about getting it due to poor service. So is it is it the Look, same? Look, I think thing? I think it depends on the country. And unfortunately for us over here, um, I can't remember the specific amount that we spent. It was quite pricey, man. But of course, like a few weeks after we purchased it, they dropped the price. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah, Murphy's law. So I think it really probably depends on um, on the country in which you are, and. W- I suppose one of the benefits to see that they are lowering the price is they're trying to make it something that's within a better reach of the people. Because something you find in the Philippines yeah, is that the internet is very costly and it's very slow, which is a, a very convenient way of keeping people ignorant and preventing them from rising above their circumstances, which, you know, that requires awareness, it requires knowledge. Knowledge and awareness or what are the real things that give rise to opportunity. You cannot pursue an opportunity if you don't have the knowledge. So um, just as an added little side note there, that's what I what I witnessed here. But I would recommend that you check out specifically in his country. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's not sure. hard to find. Yes, yeah, not hard to so find. So you've, you've written a lot of this stuff. I mean, you've got these books that are sort of, and you've got them all sorted, like you were mentioning before we started recording and, you know, You've, there, it's a whole series of books about the elite and the control system. And all that. So you've, you've sort of seen a lot of this already before the conflict in the Middle East. Did you, so what was your, what was your process like going down and digging into all these, uh, getting a little bit deeper yeah. into it since you already had a, probably a lot of that already sort of written down, right? Yeah. So this topic's definitely, is not foreign to me at all. I mean, I, I found a blog that I dug up that I can't get off the internet because this was back in the blog spot days you know, with Google Blogspot, blogger.com or whatever it's called, where I wrote a, a blog entitled um, The Dark History of Modern Zionism, and it's about 10 or 11 years old. So it's been up there for quite some time. And it, so it's a topic that I've dug into. I was already reading Theodor Herzl, who's considered to be the father of political Zionism. I was reading his journals well over a decade ago, and I was looking into the military testimony. For me, uh, a big thing has is always military testimony. I don't really want to hear the bullshit from the media. I don't want to really hear the bullshit from the uh, the politicians, the, the social media influencers, and so on and so forth. What you want to do is you want to go to the military figures that they went in as proud Zionists or proud soldiers, and they really have no logical motive um, to confess to crimes they committed because it's obviously shameful. So when they start to do that, you know, okay, this is quite a reliable source, right? And um, that for me really started to get the ball rolling. And then the more you dig into it, the more it just snowballs. And you actually begin to find that the objective reality of what we have been told is going on there, which is more aligned with kind of the, the narrative of very vulnerable poor Jews being persecuted and the Holocaust. So those, those are like the two really prominent themes, highly emotional, uh, evocative themes that make people who get engaged in the topic. And then, of course, the trigger, right? You pull the trigger, anti-Semitism. These are very emotionally evocative. And uh, any kind of impulsive emotional response to a logical question and logical scrutiny, which is what's required when you are seeking the truth. You cannot be scared to uh, look into anything no stone should be left unturned when you are dealing with people though that had this really impulsive unnatural and irrational reaction you're dealing with somebody that has some kind of trauma within their way of thinking and that could be something that's been inculcated which the establishment knows how to do that i mean they've got various ways of doing this through classical conditioning when they have these debates and it's not a real debate it's just a screaming match and so while you're watching this your mirror neurons you don't recognize it but you're actually being brainwashed to become very impulsive about this topic Instead, what's needed, and as you dig into it and you become a bit more objective and you simply say, okay, what's the truth here? And um, naturally, we we can't be fully objective. We are subjective in our experience of reality, and we all have a moral compass. At least most decent people do. And so you tend to falter through that. But as you do this, you begin to recognize that, wow, what's actually going on there is it was born literally out of terrorism. Okay, so the earliest founders the proverbial founders of israel uh they actually were radicals most of them were radical marxists and then some of them were also radicals on the right they were the earliest founding fathers 
And then the way that Israel eventually came into being, the so-called Declaration of Independence, and on the other side is known as the Nakba, was literally through terrorism. And to this day, the processes and the blueprints are still very much conducive to the way in which it was created. And uh, the only reason why it seemed like this really complex topic is because there is such a mountain of deception embedded within it that it makes it very hard to see the trees through the proverbial uh, deception of the smoke and the fog. And this is going back a little bit longer than people would think, right? Isn't it? I mean, I've oh, always oh, yeah, seen some that. posts here that were like mid-1800s, late-1800s kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so they, it, the designs were sort of seemed to be put in place. Yes. Yeah, so in the 1800s, uh, mid-1800s, and this is very important for people to, to know, there needs to be a, a fundamental distinction made between simply Judaism and Zionism, because the two can actually be antithetical, which is to say opposites. Zionism is obviously just the notion of having a Jewish homeland, and it tends to be fixated on Palestine or on Israel today, right? And by that criteria, uh, some of the most powerful and notable Zionists, and in fact the ones that were instrumental in the colonization of Palestine, were British Zionists. So these were Anglo-Saxon Zionists, and they, they were interested in specifically... I can go look up the folder while I explain it to you because I've got it on my laptop there. They were specifically interested in um, geostrategy, which is to say geopolitics. And th there's a wealth of information specifically in regards to that. Um, but here we go. Lord Palmerston. Okay. Lord Palmerston, people, anybody can go look this up. P-A-L-M-E-R-S-T-O-N. He was already discussing this in the mid-1800s, where he was saying, look, we need to settle the Jewish population in Palestine, which at that time was the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. And it's because they were interested in the place geopolitically. So it's very important to have a pulse on, uh, on what was going on, on a larger scale, on a grand scale. And this was a time of legitimate colonization. Okay, So this was when the scramble for Africa was going on. Uh, the opium wars, right? The 1800s was a very, very busy time in terms of the explosion in the Industrial Revolution because that's what it coincided with. So now railroads were being built quicker. Oil eventually got discovered. And the Middle East was viewed as one of the best regions for this specific... Um, uh, it actually goes back to somebody called uh, Halford McKinder, the Heartland Theory. So the Halford McKinder is like the father of geopolitics. And he kind of said, if you control this region, you can control the world. And it just so happens that Palestine is an instrumental part of there. Now, one of the key things to recognize in all of this, and you're going to repeatedly come back to the Rothschild's influence in all of this, and, um, and their very close relationship with the British Empire, because the Jewish and British Zionists from the beginning have had a mutual interest, and it's been a mutual pro uh, project in Palestine or in Israel. So people think that it's just it's just Jewish. It's not. It's always been an Anglo-Jewish project from its inception. And the British have actually had more of a shadowy hand, and they've used kind of the Jews more as a buffer in all of this. Um, so with the Rothschilds, what they did is they actually gave the funds to the British royals to purchase the Suez Canal. And this was during the 1800s. The significance of this is by them controlling the Suez Canal, so that the British royals and then also the um, the Rothschilds family, which have been profoundly close for centuries. They've worked very closely together, even up until recently um, with uh, Evelyn de Rothschilds death, I think it was last year, I can't remember specifically when it was, and it probably still continues with other Rothschild family members, they've been personal advisors to the royal family, and it's always been like that, they've got a very, very close relationship, so you can't think of one independent of the other, is what I'm saying, especially when it comes to business decisions. So with um, the Suez Canal purchase, what happened was the Rothschild family gave them the funds. Now the significance of controlling this region is you can actually control trade or at least back then you could because it allowed you can to control a very key port in the waters so naturally in relation to population control in relation to controlling commodities in relation to controlling the great game as they call it this place is imperative so 
based this on is connecting, this is connecting the Mediterranean with the Red Sea, right? Right through Egypt there, right? Is that the, the one? Um, I, I, that sounds about right. Honestly, my geography in the specifics like that, I don't know, but you could just, just yeah. look it up and um, yeah. <clears throat> to, to put it into perspective, how significant the Suez Canal is. Okay. Uh, prior to World War One, leading up to it, there was something called the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad. Now, the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad was going to be an agreement between the German Empire and then the um, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. And I remember when I'm saying Ottoman Empire, this included Palestine. This was in that Middle Eastern region. And they were going to build this railway and this was going to bypass the Suez Canal. Okay. And uh, this is now recognized as being one of the leading causes behind the First World War being kickstarted and kicked off was it the development of this railroad because it would bypass the Suez Canal. So now the reason why I'm mentioning this is one of the reasons they wanted to have some kind of uh, presence, the British, in Palestine. And naturally the Rothschilds, again, when, they, or when we talk about the British royals, we have to talk about the Rothschilds. They are business partners. They always have been. And I can go through a list of different things that they have financed them with all kinds of different wars and so on and so forth. But that's one of the reasons as well why they wanted to have a presence in Palestine is to secure the Suez Canal. And also in the 1920s, they in fact developed um, an oil pipeline through Haifa uh, to go ahead and secure some of the oil that they would transport through the region. So geopolitically, there's a very significant reason for that. And then also there was a report that was commissioned just after, uh, I think it was... Uh, specific parts of Palestine were captured where they claimed, and this is in the early 1900s, where they claimed that the Dead Sea held trillions, okay, trillions with a T in um, natural resource wealth. Uh, had huge, huge amounts of natural potash and all of these different resources within the Dead Sea. You can just, you can probably look it up, just um, go do an internet search, Dead Sea to yield trillions with a T. And then put like newspaper archive and something may come up for that. Otherwise, I can look it up on my laptop very quickly and probably find something for you. So my point being geopolitically, there's plenty reasoning behind wanting to um, get a hold of this area. And this was going back to the 1800s where they're already plotting on how can we, we get this piece of land. And it had nothing to do with religious conviction. Um, although I would like to mention, and this is naturally we need to view things oh there you go perfect man we need to view things in uh the appropriate light which is um that politically speaking yes there was an element in the 1800s where they said oh this is about geopolitics but it's also about you know to do the, the right thing religiously and it's about you know settling the people in their homeland and so on and so forth because there always has to be that component because what what was was that the ottoman back then then that area Sorry, say that again. Who was who was in that area? Not who, but uh, the, the Ottoman Empire was a very large piece of land. So yeah, Palestine was, that, was, was covering Israel then back then. Oh, yeah. Basically, oh, yeah. all the Arabs, I think, right, or like yeah, all of the Semites, the Semites. Yeah. Yes, it was massive. It was a very piece, a big piece of land. And uh, then Turkey? another. Sorry. What about Turkey? Well, Turkey yeah, it was, was the Ottoman too. Been, yeah. Yes, it, it was covering Turkey too. So the Ottoman Empire sometimes interchangeably referred to as the Turkish Empire because uh, the Turks were the ones that were in power at that point in time. And um, another very significant thing just to point out is at that time they were also recognized as the sick man of the Middle East. And if anybody knows the history with a country, let's say like China, when China became the sick man of Asia, then all the proverbial vultures they start to circle because they see as a country it's on its way out how can we get inside and get a hold of the trade exploit the cheap labor so my reasoning for just mentioning this is there's very practical reasons that extend far beyond the kind of religious disguise that it's entrenched in today so initially it started off about geopolitics this wasn't about the kind of the very evocative um, misleading uh, tribal religious narrative that we told about today. Yeah, so there you can see, man. It's it's the Ottoman Empire was a very very large tract, 
and uh, would have had a real uh, problem with the Romans. You know, it's like half of Rome. Yeah, the, the Ottoman Empire was around for quite some time. You know, it was around for quite some time. But then in the 1800s, uh, and it's actually very skillful how they did this, they started to float the Turkish authorities' loans. There was also the Young Turk Revolution, but they floated them loans, the, uh, a lot of European families, including the Rothschilds. And as Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson famously wrote, banks are more powerful than standing armies, right? It's a very few people recognize it, but it's it's actually a war institution. Um, not all of them, but when weaponized and skillfully done, a private central bank certainly because it can put an entire country in debt. And once you have a country in debt and you have the authorities in debt, that's it. You got them in your pocket. So was that the British Roundtable that you uh, that you were mentioning? Is that kind of the way you describe the Rothschilds and the British Royals? There is that part of that Roundtable. So, so it's all it all connects in one way or another. But the round table group is a shadowy group that um, I first became aware of from Professor Carol Quigley. And Professor Carol Quigley, I'm sure you guys have heard his name floating around, right? His um, tragedy, like and a, hope. yeah, tragedy and hope, exactly. And the Anglo American establishment. Uh, he was a seminal authority in the Ivy League schools. He taught at Harvard. He taught at Georgetown University. Bill Clinton was deeply influenced in former President Bill Clinton, and he has been consistently and repeatedly named by all of these kind of elite uh, people in society that fill these administerial um, jobs as being their favorite course. He was an exceptional teacher, and he started to go through archival material, and he started to illuminate about this roundtable organization and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And he, he basically demonstrated how there's like this shadowy global conspiracy to control the world. And this can be traced for people who want to just check it out. Maybe you've never heard of it before. Go look up Cecil Rhodes' wills, his dying wills. And in there, he talks about it's It's very unambiguous, very clear. Anybody can check it out. So I'm not taking anything out of context. He basically calls for a secret society. Literally, that was his own words. He wants a secret society that can extend the rule of the British Empire and regain control over the United States as well. And they said, oh, you know, we need a secret society to do this. And they came up with different concepts of how they could figure this out. And one of them was the Roundtable Group. And the Roundtable Group was a think tank. That's essentially what it was. They had their own peer review journal. Um, it was very difficult to, to find out this kind of information 10, 15 years ago, but today, you can find this info on Wikipedia, which is, it just shows you how, uh, not to say Wikipedia is the unadulterated, trustworthy source of news, but of course, water leaks through the proverbial cracks. And that's a testament to how the information revolution that has swept the whole entire globe, the whole world, is um, is just so powerful that the establishment can't actually contend with they, it. And they, they won't be able to. They can't contain it. No, they can't. No, hell no. Hell no. That's, um, what so been, anyway. that's what I've been thinking lately is that all these all these protests and the the trackers tractors the the the, the farmers like just everybody is is coming too much brother the world is too, yeah. is too much they, they are very so you get unfortunately people who not fully recognizing the um, how psychological warfare works and one of the basic tenets which is that you the first thing you want to do is pacify the enemy mentally because if you do that, then you don't have to fight them. So that's always their first goal is to pacify us mentally, right? Subjugate us mentally so we defeat ourselves internally. So a lot of people have this like this view that the establishment the parasite class, oh, they're omnipotent. They can never be beat. Everything they do is calculated and planned. I would argue that um, whilst there are elements of that, it's overwhelmingly by today's standards reactionary where they're actually reacting to things that we're doing. But um, just in relation to the roundtable group, to try to summarize it, they came up with the concept of a commonwealth of nations. They were actually the ones that came up with this idea. And this isn't me reading into it. You can, again, you can even find this info on Wikipedia. They literally, from an academic standpoint, came up with the concept of a commonwealth of nations. For those who aren't familiar with what that means, the commonwealth uh, was presented. You know how I was talking about Elon Musk. He's one of these figures that needs to be ahead. And he, he serves to kind of co opt the movement that's already in place. Back then, there were a lot of states that were agitating around the world, a lot of countries, nations, 
They were agitating for independence. So this was already in place. It was moving. The, uh, the wheels were turning. And so naturally they saw this and they wanted to maintain their power. And they came up with the idea of a commonwealth of nations. The commonwealth represents former countries that were uh, basically British colonies. They were controlled outright by the British establishment, by the British Empire. So what he wanted to do was give the illusion of autonomy. Right, Canada is in fact one of these countries. Give the illusion of independence and autonomy, but secretly they still are the ones that are pulling the strings. Now, the significance as it relates to Palestine and Israel is this coincides with that period. And they played a seminal role from start to finish in the uh, establishment of um, Palestine and Israel. So the Balfour Declaration, okay, we can start with that. With the Balfour Declaration, we know that this was made out by Lord Balfour to, to Lord Rothschild. Um, for those who aren't familiar, just go look it up very quickly. Very easy to find. And this is a, the significance of this document is this was the document promising the land of Palestine to the Jews, even though the year prior they had promised the land to the Arabs. Okay, that's where a lot of this the duplicity and the contention comes from. They were simultaneously making promises to both sides. And they made this promise to the Jews uh, through the Balfour Declaration. And it appears that it was just Lord Balfour making this declaration to Lord Rothschild. But now we know that there were several authors involved. And the most significant of these authors was Leo Amory and Alfred Milner. Well, Alfred Milner and Leo Amory were trustees of Cecil Rhodes Wall and they were members of the Round Table Group. Leo Amory, in fact, was the longest standing trustee of Cecil Rhodes' will. So you, you may have heard of Rhodes Scholars, right? Yep. Rhodes Scholars, that, that yep. they have all these elite people that come from there. Part of the whole secret society concept was to use the Rhodes Scholarship for that purpose, to insert people in different places of, of influence. So they were the ones behind the drafting of the Balfour Declaration. They also had very early relationships. For example, there's a guy by the name of Vladimir Zahev Jabotinsky, who... Um, in order to understand the crazy ideology of the state of Israel, you need to know who Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky is. He's the most commemorated figure in Israel's history. He's the most celebrated person. He's got several dozen roads, uh, buildings, and so on and so forth named after him. And he's the father of something called revisionist Zionism. Okay. If you're going to look into Zionism, whoever's listening to this, look into revisionist Zionism. And to break it down, so things will get more complex and say, oh, shit, yeah, we go. here's another term. Because these terms always make things unnaturally complex. All that revisionist Zionism is, is that people may have heard of the concept of a greater Israel, right? With the Zionist project for the Middle East. The greater Israel project is revisionist Zionism. All it is about is basically having a larger tract of land. So although they were non-religious, and this is uh, very important and crucial for people to understand. The founding fathers of Israel were overwhelmingly non-religious, either, either non-religious, either atheist, or they were nihilists, which is to say that you just think life has no purpose whatsoever. Um, despite being th that being their proclivity, they were more than happy to quote the Bible and to quote the Torah because the Torah is based on the Old Testament of the Bible or vice versa, I should say. They were very, very happy to quote this as being like an historically accurate document for the claim to greater Israel. So the kingdom of David, the 12 tribes of Judah, if you go look it up, which is a point of contention amongst historians. But if you go and look it up, that's essentially what they're aiming for. And they were very unambiguous. And this is where this is what we haven't been told about. So from the, the get-go, from the beginning, with these very early founding fathers of, uh, of Israel that came into Palestine, they were a tiny minority. But you know what they did from immediately from setting foot? They said, look, we want to get rid of the Arab majority and instead replace them with the Jewish majority. And we want to have a, a land that extends both sides of the Jordan. So the land we had to kind of break this down. What we see today... It goes far From the beyond to the that. Sea. Yeah, there you go. Boom. And um, the, the land that we recognize as the Jordanian Empire, well, it's not the Jordanian Empire now, but Jordan, they, that's also part of it. Um, and, and this is the ethos of revisionist Zionism. And the significance of this is Benjamin Netanyahu, he is a child of revisionist Zionism. Okay. 
man, there's so much to get into about all of it. But the Likud Party, which he is currently the chair of the Likud Party, the Likud Party is the party of revisionist Zionism. They are also the, the party that were born out of an organization, a, lit, a literal and actual terrorist organization called the Urgan. And uh, the guy who started the Likud Party was a guy by the name of Menachem Bechin. Okay, Menachem Bechin. Oh, I think your mic is off there, Graham. How do you, uh, how do you spell that? Lik, Likud? M- 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 uh, Likud, it's L-I-K-U-D. The Likud Party, yeah. And very interesting, in 1948, Albert Einstein and about a dozen other very prominent Jews, uh, they warned in 1948, so this was very shortly after Israel declared its independence, they warned Americans of a guy by the name of Menachem Begin, who I just mentioned. Uh, They warned America, they said, look, these individuals are like Nazis. That's what he said. Not me. He said they are like Nazis and they are like fascists and they committed massacres during the uh, so-called Declaration of Independence. And they try, They basically tried to warn America. They said, whatever you do, don't financially support this guy. Don't morally support him. Don't, don't do any of that. And unfortunately, in the long run, Menachem Begin, he became the prime minister of Israel and the Likud party rose to power. And their first chairman was Menachem Begin, and the second one was a guy by the name of Itzhak Shamir, who was the leader at one time of Lehi. The Lehi were even worse than the Ergun. They actually sought out an alliance with Hitler. I suppose, let me just slow down because people's heads are probably spinning now. And then the third chair is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So when was that? When was the, the Likud party? When, when was that that you're talking about? Okay, so you know what? Maybe what I, what I should do because there's just so much to unpack, and I'm sure people's heads are spinning right now, just hearing some of that stuff. Let's start off, if you will allow me to. Let's start off with how some of the founding fathers, their roots, which was in uh, the radical ethos that came from the Russian Empire. Then we'll gradually go into um, kind of the British mandate over Palestine, and then from the British mandate, we'll get into how. The, they declared independence, like the war for independence. And then from the war of independence, that's when the Likud began to emerge. First as the Harut party, H-E-R-U-T, and then they became the Likud party later. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first thing we need to understand is during the 1800s in the Russian Empire, um, this was, of course, around the time of Karl Marx and different academics and intellectuals that were espousing the ideology of nihilism. Now, for people who aren't familiar with nihilism, um, it's basically the belief, it's very cynical, that life has no purpose. For those who are fans of The Matrix, uh, one of my favorite, favorite films that had a very big part in my own personal journey, they may know of a little nugget in the film where Neo which in ancient Greek means the new one. And Morpheus, of course, in ancient Greek mythology, he is the messenger of the gods. He imparts divine knowledge. So he's like the person that imparts divine truth, right? He gives you truth. And so he's sleeping in the opening scene that we find near. He's sleeping on his laptop, on his computer. They didn't have laptops back there. And he's searching. He's sleeping, right? This is an allegory. He's sleeping, but he's searching. And who's he searching for? He's searching for this messenger of truth. Then eventually he gets the knock on the door. And uh, then they say, oh, follow the white rabbit, right? which is in relation to Alice in Wonderland. When the guy comes to the door and uh, Neo goes to get a disc and he, he goes into a book because he's selling something on the black market to these people. If you pause it where he opens this book, it's on the chapter about nihilism because at this point in the new one's journey, he feels like life has no purpose. That's the significance there. So just thought I'd add that there for people who are a fan of the Matrix uh, before I start to geek out. I think this passport expires on September 11th, 2001 too. Yeah, which is very interesting. Yeah, I've seen that before. The Matrix yeah. is such a good film, man. Um, so anyways, they, they were nihilists. This guy's and, to the chicks now, so, you know. Yeah, which is wild. Yeah, the, I mean, I've, this, I've thought to myself that uh, there might be some MK Ultra meddling going on there, like literally, because that was one of the things that they outlined was how they can sabotage people 
and um, and do so in all kinds of different ways, discredit them publicly and, and so on, because it's, that's a really very, very big leap to make um, in their former positions. And one of them as well was... Uh, yeah, well, one of them specifically was very outspoken about, oh, you need to mask up for the pandemic and everybody's going to die if you don't mask up and take vaccines. Like, what the fuck? Like, kind of like rage against the machine or Jesse Ventura, right? All these people acting fucking just insane. But anyways, yeah, to get back at the topic at hand. During this time was also a rise of radicalism. And uh, there was an organization specifically so some of the founding fathers, if you look at the founding fathers of Israel, very early on, the first colonizers in Palestine, the Jews that settled there, so when they this, will come. What's the year? Sorry? What would the year be? What what year? This was in the 1800s. About? Yeah, this is in the 1800s towards so the like very in... end of the 1800s. To, towards the very end of the yeah. 1800s. So we're talking about 1880s, 1890s predominantly. And a, a good so marker. So not technically Israel. No, no, this Not was still Palestine. Israel at that yeah. time. It would be Palestine. This was yeah. Palestine. This was when this was when the very first they called them kibbutz. This was when the first kibbutz were being established, which is small colon, colonies of Jews, okay, were being developed in Palestine. And it was actually being done on the patronage of Baron Edmund de Rothschild. So, like <laughs> I said, we're gonna keep on seeing the Rothschild's name. Yeah, the, if you look at Baron Edmund de Rothschild. They don't gloat about it anymore, but in the past they did because now it's obviously frowned upon. But he was known as the father of Palestinian colonization, the father of Palestinian colonization. OK. And so he was a, a patron behind settling these Jews from the Russian Empire into Palestine. Now, the significance here is there were some very radical Jews that were coming. Some of them were terrorists. And when I talk about Jews, it's very difficult for people because we've been so indoctrinated to be emotional about this jewish uh, being jewish before being religious is is just simply a, a, about being an ethnic jew and even within uh, the ethnicity of being jewish there's several different distinctions there's ashkenazi jews there's uh, mizrahi jews and then there's also um, sephardic jews so there's three different distinctions there the one being mostly european jews the ashkenazis the Mizrahi are the ones that come from the Arab countries. And then the Sephardic are the ones that come from Spain or Portugal and around that area. And even within there, there's raci racism within uh, the Jewish ethnicities. You know, So it, it's a lot more complex than we've been told. But long story short, these Which radicals were the coming. Tunnel Jews? Which Sorry? ones are the tunnel Jews? Which ones are the tunnel Jews? <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't actually be able to tell you, man. I think there's probably a mixture going on there. But... What I can tell you is that the elite amongst the Jews are generally considered to be the Ashkenazis. However, it's not exclusive to them. Like Moses Montefiore, he was a Sephardic Jew, and he and the Rothschilds were very, very close. So there's always overlap. You know, at the highest levels, they don't necessarily appear to be too concerned with uh, ethnicity and religion. They, are, in fact, historically they've you they've invented these oftentimes, or at least. Um, added fuel to the fire to use these distinctions to kind of divide and conquer us with. Uh, yeah. Darren, Darren but, don't you have a bit of Ashkenazi in you? 5% allegedly. 5% Ashkenazi. Oh, well, well look, That's I mean, just for, for the record, <laughs> look, just for the record, I want to say that um, I dated a girl that was an Ashkenazi Jew and she was amazing, man. Uh, such as a sweet, beautiful, lovely human being. So people mustn't get hung up on these very trivial distinctions. Overwhelmingly, the overwhelming majority of people, irrespective of skin color, culture, and so on, are decent people. You know, um, yeah, you just got to assess people based on their actions and, and what they're really doing behind the scenes, especially when they're pretending to be good, but outwardly, or outwardly the sheep, um, but inwardly the wolf, right? So just to get back to from the Russian Empire, uh, some of the people that were coming there, man, were legitimate terrorists. So they were coming from an organization. I don't know specifically the um, the Russian uh, term, but it translated into English. It was called the People's Will. Okay, the People's Will. Um, I can actually probably just look it up and share the screen with you so people can check it out for themselves. There you go, because I've got this stuff saved on you. Sure, yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to pronounce it. It's Narodnaya Volya. 
So N A R O D N A Y A. <laughs> and in Volia at the end, V O L Y A. And that's translated into the people's will. So a significant number, it was a minority nonetheless, but a significant number of the executive committee were made up of ethnic Jews. Now, the, again, these were non-religious Jews, but a significant number was made up of ethnic Jews. And so um, during that time, the Tsarist Russia was also very much uh, very Christian. And there were lots of rumors going on around about the Jews. So historically, that's also actually been a thing, right? Uh, Anti-Semitism has been a legit thing, man. Um, and this is oftentimes 